Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 18th meeting of the committee in 2013. Uh, can I ask everyone to ensure that mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off, please? Uh, agenda item one is uh, uh, oral evidence as part of our pre-budget scrutiny of the Scottish 2014-15 draft budget. Uh, the purpose of this pre-budget scrutiny is to both look at back at the challenges faced by local authorities in recent years and look forward over the next few years. We are aiming to examine the big picture, looking at high-level local government budget information. Uh, the evidence we receive from this pre-budget scrutiny will feed directly into our formal uh, budget scrutiny in autumn 2013. Uh, last week, we heard from the Accounts Commission for Scotland, academics and key service providers. Today, we will hear from the Scottish Government and local authorities. We have two panels of, of witnesses this morning, so I'd like to start by welcoming uh, our first panel, uh, John Swinney, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, Bill Stitt, Assistant Team Leader, Local Government Division, and Terry Holmes, Head of Corporate Reporting, Accountancy and Governance at the Scottish Government. Can I ask uh, Mr Swinney uh, if he wants to make an opening statement, please? Thank you, Convener. I uh, would like to make a, an opening statement and to welcome the opportunity to discuss local government finance settlements past, present and future ahead of the Government's draft budget for 2014-15. In particular, I know the committee will want to con concentrate today on the prospects for 2014-15, but before doing so, I think it would be helpful to reflect on uh, some of the steps that have taken us to reach this particular point. It is clear that local government and central government in Scotland will continue to face many challenges, particularly in 2014-15, uh, um, but it is equally clear to me that the solution to many of these challenges can be found in the partnership working that is at the heart of this government's policy and its approach to local government in Scotland. A clear example of this was the joint agreement to provide additional funding for our new council tax reduction scheme, with the government contributing £23 million and local government providing £17 million to help fill the gap left by the UK government to make sure that those who previously got help with their council tax will continue to have access to the same level of support um, this year. <coughs> As the committee will know, and the foundations of our partnership working approach were set out in the Concordat, which was jointly signed with local government in September 2007. Uh, this provided the framework for the joint working that we have established over the last five and a half years based on mutual respect. This has freed up councils from previous central government micromanagement and delivered real benefits for the people of Scotland. Clearly, a key benefit for the people of Scotland has been the six years of council tax freeze. The Scottish Government has fully funded the freeze, but it could not have happened without the full agreement of our local government partners. The 2014-15 plan set out in the 2013-14 draft budget already include a further £70 million to enable the freeze to continue next year, and we are con committed to its continuation for the remainder of this Parliament. The key benefits for local government have been the fair and reasonable funding settlements and the reduction in ring fencing and the associated regulation and bureaucracy costs from a total of £2.7 billion in 2008 to less than £200 million this year, which equates to a reduction of more than 93% in six years in ring fencing. Indeed, the only remaining revenue ring fence grant is, that is now distributed to individual local authorities is for the Gaelic language, and this amounts to £4.5 million. On the question of funding settlements, the resources within the Scottish Government's control increased by 6.4% between 2007-08 and 2012-13, whereas local government's budgets have increased by 8.9%, thus demonstrating the strong financial settlements agreed with local government during very challenging times. Um, turning to the future, the Government has already started discussions with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities on next year's local government finance settlement. The outcome of the spending review in 2011 resulted in flat cash local government revenue settlements for the three-year period 2012-13 to 14-15 and the maintenance of local government's share of the total capital budget at 28%. These outcomes are factored into the updated plans for 2014-15 for set out in the draft budget, but they will need to be reviewed again in the light of various changes to local government responsibilities since these figures were first published. Uh, firstly, there was the transfer of responsibility for the police and fire services from local government to the new single bodies. This resulted in the removal of £1.6 billion from the local government finance settlement and reflected in the updated 2014-15 um, uh, plans. 
there are a number of additional financial pressures facing local government, not least those resulting from the UK government's welfare reform programme. We also know that future budgetary concerns will be a key challenge given the UK government's approach to public expenditure. Um, the Scottish Government has worked with local government on the issue of capital expenditure. Um, we have um, worked to reshape the overall um, uh, spread of, of capital expenditure by local authorities to um, assist the government in delivering its capital priorities. Uh, but over the duration of the spending review, there will be um, the local government will receive 28% of the capital resources available to, to the government. Uh, local government has a key role to play in the successful transformation of public services to improve outcomes, to respond to financial and demographic challenges and to create a fair and more equal Scotland. In particular, local government, through the, uh, together with their community planning partners, have a significant leadership role to play in driving the shift towards prevention, which, as the committee will know, is a major feature of this spending review period. Um, local government is strongly supportive of this approach, um, and we work together th effectively through the National Community Planning Group to ensure that progress is made on undertaking the approach to public service reform. Uh, the Government has endeavoured over the course of the last few years to deliver the strongest financial settlement to local government in the context of the pressures that we are wrestling with in terms of public expenditure. And I look forward to discussing those issues with the committee this morning. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. If I could maybe start off um, by asking you uh, about demographic uh, change. Uh, last week, witnesses uh, were talking quite a lot about uh, uh, an uh, increasingly elderly population and the difficulties uh, that that will have on local government finance. Uh, you mentioned preventative spend there. Can I ask uh, how the government uh, is dealing uh, with uh, that uh, uh, shift towards a, a more elderly population and how we will tackle uh, the increases in spend that some foresee, uh, uh, which could be the case if we don't move to prevention? The answer to, to that question, Kavina, lies essentially in the government's response to the Christie Commission report, and particularly the focus that we have uh, established around the, the four pillars of public service reform, on the, the focus on, on, on partnership, on, uh, on people, on prevention, and on performance. And um, essentially, these um, are unifying approaches across the public sector, because they recognise that we have to, in responding to the issues that you raised, convener, about the pattern of demographic change and the financial constraints with which we operate, that we need to significantly adapt the way in which we deliver public services. So that will create the necessity for greater working, joint working between different public bodies. So the agenda that uh, Mr Neil has taken forward in relation to adult health and social care integration, uh, very much in partnership with local government, is designed to draw together those elements of public service that will deal primarily with the issues around elderly care within our society. Um, so that's, in a sense, an illustration of the partnership element. On the prevention theme, um, again, we um, take an approach which is designed to try to envisage as far as it is um, possible the instances where support will make um, a, a material difference to the quality of life of any of our citizens and therefore um, avoiding the necessity for more expensive forms of care than we can, uh, the, 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 the ordinarily we would want to provide for individuals. So essentially, the, the approach to dealing with those demographic and financial challenges is by pursuing the agenda, on, um, uh, which is our response to the Christie Commission. Uh, this agenda has been uh, embraced by local government. It is embraced by our public sector partners and is essentially driven forward by the work that is undertaken in the National Community Planning Group, which, as the committee I think will be familiar, is chaired by uh, Mr Pat Waters. Um, who obviously has extensive experience in the local government sector, but also um, has, uh, is now acquiring wider ex expertise in the, in the public sector as convener uh, of the Fire and Rescue Board. Thank you. Stuart McMillan, please. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Just as a brief question regarding the preventative spend. Um, are you satisfied that uh, with the, the large sums of money that the government have actually allocated towards preventative spend, are you satisfied that that, that, that uh, investment 
actually is being used for what it should be used for as compared to uh, potentially maybe being uh, some money has been taken aside from, uh, from within the public sector and used to maybe shore up some uh, existing services. I am satisfied by that point because in relation to the three um, change funds the, the, there is a mechanism in place to judge the um, the, the, the the, the, the um, details of the projects upon which the resources are being utilised. Um, so that, that uh, um, process is in place in all three change funds and um, there is a requirement for um, those resources to be used to support um, projects that essentially deal with the early intervention and uh, that, that is the essential qualification criteria. What I would caution against is a view developing that the, the only money that should be used on prevention is the 500 million that is involved in these three change funds. I'm, you know, expressly make, would want to make it clear that I do not view that as being the only money that should be considered for prevention. Um, over a three-year period in the change funds, we will allocate 500 million pounds to be deployed on prevention. Meanwhile in general funding between the health service and local government in Scotland will spend in excess of £60 billion. Now, if we're spending £60 billion, I want to see as much of that money being used on prevention. So the change funds are there to initiate good practice, to encourage joint working. But what I think we're beginning to see now from the evidence that I see from community planning partnerships is an increasing amount of joint working at local level between um, the health service and local government and other partners, particularly third sector partners, which is now looking at how we can utilise that £60 billion of public sector funding and deploy that most effectively to deal with prevention. Just one more, if it's okay. Briefly, yeah. Uh, just, you mentioned the third sector partners there. Um, do you foresee a, a, a greater role for the third sector in uh, helping to deliver uh, some of the services that, uh, that, that we've been talking about? I, I do, yes. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think this is probably capable of being answered fairly briefly, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, given that we're looking at public service reform, there are clearly a number of bodies that are part of the uh, local government family that it may be time to revisit whether they're worth having um, or whether their current roles should be refined so they cost less or deliver more. And I'm thinking particularly of regional transport partnerships. I'm thinking of community planning partnerships, although I think I can see the work on CPPs that is repositioning them to be more useful. And there may be other bodies, uh, indeed, um, out with the remit of this committee, uh, would be the national parks that in many ways supplant uh, the responsibilities of local government. And I just wondered if the government is looking at whether a number of these ancillary bodies that are costing a fair bit of money are uh, delivering value for money or sufficiently significant policy uh, interventions that address the people prevention and performance agenda? The, uh, I think the short answer, well, the short answer is that the government is always looking at the architecture of organisations and the costs associated with them. That's a, it's, a, it's a continuous priority for me, and as the committee will be aware, um, the government is um, it committed itself to reduce the number of public bodies by 25%. We are heading to exceed that target uh, as part of our reform work. Um, so I, I acknowledge the, um, the importance of keeping these issues under review. Having said that, um, I, I am not aware of any active proposals to um, reform regional transport partnerships. Um, it's an area for which I, I don't have ministerial responsibility any longer. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any proposals that are emerging from Mr Brown in that respect. Um, on national parks, um, I can say definitively the government is, uh, is content to maintain the national parks and we believe the national parks are adding um, significant value in terms of the coordination um, of the stewardship of these very important parts of our natural and national landscape. On community planning partnerships, I have been, you know, community planning partnerships have been around for a long time. They were legislated for in the 2003 Act. Uh, I think it's pretty fair to say that they've been talking shops for most of the time. Um, 
we have um, acknowledged, I think, the shift of our policy thinking into um, a broader role for local government, which was envisaged under the Concordat. And then, in the subsequent um, acceptance of the Christie Commission recommendations, community planning partnerships are utterly central to delivering the reform agenda, because they are the forum in which we must have meaningful discussion about how we draw together the agendas of different public sector partners. Not just about drawing together the agenda of the health service and local government, principal though that is in the dialogue, also drawing together the input of Police Scotland, of the Fire and Rescue Service, um, of various other public bodies in certain parts of the country, the national parks um, will be relevant in that respect. Because what I am convinced of, and this is at the heart of the government's public service reform agenda, is that no public services are delivered, nor are major outcomes achieved, unless we work out with the compartments of policy. And the community planning partnerships are designed to do exactly that for us, that we break down the boundaries between organisations, um, Mr Mackay and Mr Neil and I have been encouraging um, relevant public bodies to come to a community planning partnership, not to present the budget they have de decided upon, but to have a conversation before they set their budget on how their respective budgets can be formed to meet the objectives of the community planning partnership. And through that approach, that's just one example of how we envisage a more integrated and cohesive agenda being delivered at local level, which will assist us in producing public service reform and in meeting the expectations of members of the public, which was inherent in the first question that the convener asked me. Mitchell, please. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. In your opening remarks, you, you refer to the, the National Community Planning Group as providing leadership, as being an organisation you will um, work with in the preventative spend agenda. You've mentioned the need for a holistic approach as opposed to everyone working in splendid isolation, and I can see how you could look at the national group as a way of providing strategy. However, there is a concern that this could be another top-down approach. And while you talk about working with local organisations and um, public, um, public sector organisations at local level, the one thing you don't appear to have covered is the real community engagement. And we know as a committee, from going out and talking to these, um, these various groups, they can tell to a penny what they can save. And, and give very clear examples of preventative spend and how the projects that they're suggesting really do work and provide value for money and a good service and cater for the vulnerable. How are you going to ensure these organisations are listened to and they get the, the funding they deserve, which is entirely in keeping with the preventative spend agenda? Well, I, let me say at the outset, I, 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 I accept the, 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 the significance and the importance of the question that, uh, that uh, Mrs Mitchell raises. And I, I would want to, at the outset of my response, give a, a, an absolutely clear assurance that I do not view the community planning, um, the National Community Planning Group as some um, supervisory governance structure or chamber for regulating what's going on at local level. It is there to encourage and motivate and ensure that all community planning partnerships in their localities are actually delivering on this agenda, but it is not there to say it must be done this way or that way, because I acknowledge that in different parts of the country, the solutions to some of the questions that we are wrestling with here will be fundamentally different, given the geography or the makeup of the population or some of the social and economic challenges that will exist in different localities. The, the, the second bit of reassurance I would give is, is, is perhaps to explain to the committee the approach that I took at uh, a major event last week, which was the second of the learning sessions of the Early Years Collaborative, which was a gathering of 800 um, uh, public servants and interested parties from all 32 community planning partnerships around the country, focusing on how we integrate services 
to deliver better outcomes for our youngest citizens. And essentially what I said to that grouping, and these are actually the people that Margaret Mitchell's talking about, the folk who actually get their hands dirty designing these projects at local level and making the difference, that I wanted them to feel as if they had a green light to undertake the reform at local level, that they weren't waiting for somebody a way up in National Community Planning Group or in Parliament or in the government to say, yeah, that's OK, go ahead and do that. They were, they had the, they were empowered to take forward that reform agenda at local level. And I completely accept the point that Margaret Mitchell makes, that um, meaningful reform will only have an effect if it happens at local level within Scotland. Um, so I hope, that, I hope that gives a bit of context around my uh, view of the National Community Planning Group and what role it can perform. On the question of community engagement, again, I accept that um, community engagement will determine whether we are largely whether we're successful or unsuccessful in this endeavour. Um, a, a reform proposal which comes forward from a public body out of the blue, uh, which is launched on a community in, in the fashion of this is what we have come, we've decided and we're coming to do to you, is pretty much destined to fail, I would imagine. The more successful community engagement exercises are about where communities are invited to formulate, in partnership with public bodies, how we might reform and revise public services at local level. And um, I would be the first to acknowledge that the public sector isn't always that perfect at designing those community engagement exercises. I think there are some very good examples, and I've seen some of them in the communities that I represent. Um, and in other parts of the country. Um, but I think the importance that has to be attached to um, meaningful dialogue with communities to ensure that we understand their aspirations, their hopes and their plans, and they can be reflected in public sector reform proposals is absolutely fundamental to this exercise. I've got partial reassurance, Cabinet Secretary, but I still think it's a case of, you know, here's an idea and we'll engage fully and we'll take your ideas on board. Sometimes the actual initiative, the, the plan itself, can be delivered by the community and it's where, you know, the checks and balances are to ensure that the local authority lets go. doesn't just say, right, we've consulted, that was very interesting, now we'll now go and do what we, we intended to, that they actually get the funding where they've proved they can deliver value for money. I, 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 I pretty much agree with, with all of that. And I think the, what I've tried to suggest is that the government is actively encouraging um, a culture of empowerment at local level. And this will be reflected again in the Community Empowerment Bill, which uh, the government brings to Parliament. Um, a sense that communities should be um, feel free to take the initiative and to be empowered to, to take forward this agenda. So um, I certainly would want to encourage an understanding and acceptance of that point. Um, I, I, I happened this morning um, to um, be well, I was responding to a constituent point um, where a, a, an excellent uh, local venture, um, a, a lunch club in my constituency <coughs> just um, uh, the other day was awarded uh, the Queen's Award for volunteering. Um, they're a, a, a local lunch club for senior citizens. They started themselves. They went to the local authority and the health board and said, look, we are doing quite well. We're gathering 120 senior citizens together every fortnight for a lunch and we're doing other things. We're having walking groups, we're having reading groups, we're having this, that and the next thing. And the local authority and the health board put in a very, very small amount of money. But the impact of that money in terms of what is delivered for the senior citizens in the town of Ayleth, where this lunch club exists, is in, of a, extraordinary a, a comparison to the amount of money the public sector is putting in. But crucially, it's exactly what Margaret Mitchell has talked about. It's a local venture. It is run by the local community. The public sector supports it, doesn't get in the road, doesn't try to control it, does all it can to help it on its way. And as a consequence, we're seeing very good outcomes in that locality for those citizens. So I would very much want to encourage uh, 
and uh, that, that, that type of approach that has been suggested. Very reassuring, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, John Pentland, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, on a Cabinet Secretary, the, uh, earlier you mentioned the uh, Christie Commission, and uh, how do you feel, how, how does the wider Christie Commission and public service reform agenda assist in dealing with budget reductions, or, or do you think that, that we are perhaps being dishonest if we refuse to accept that budget cuts are a huge obstacle to effective public service reform? Um, I think the, 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 the answer I'd give on the Christie Commission is that I essentially see the um, thinking of the Christie Commission and the government's response to the Christie Commission as the way in which we do two things. We deliver public service reform and we manage the budgetary pressures that we face. That is my, that's my strategy for dealing with the uh, budgetary constraints that we face and for dealing with the wider necessity of public service reform, which arises out of the convener's question to me earlier on this morning. Um, so, uh, th 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 uh, and I think what's important is that we need to encourage participation in that agenda amongst all public bodies at all levels of government within Scotland, and that's very much the focus of the agenda the government takes forward. So, so do you think then that the budget cuts are, are, are an obstacle to budget uh, I, I, public service reform? I don't take the view that we need to spend more money to improve public services. I, that, that's not a view that I take. I think it is possible to uh, use the same amount of money to deliver better outcomes for members of the public um, if we create the right climate. Now, if we um, compartmentalise resources, if we uh, don't get organisations to work together, if we, um, if we see organisational boundaries and say, well, we're not breaking those organisational boundaries, these will be the impediments to public service reform. But I think what we... Um, have got to do as uh, a public sector is work increasingly together. Um, that's the partnership sense of the Christie agenda. We've got to um, focus much more on preventative interventions, which is what the integrated health and social care agenda is all about. We've got to work with our people who work in local government to get them to work differently and to work collaboratively. And in my experience, there's a tremendous enthusiasm to do that at the coalface uh, of public services in Scotland. And we've also got to be um, open to improvements in performance and how we deliver improvements in performance, not in some sort of crude league table fashion. Um, you know, we've got, to under look at, we've got to look around the public sector and see where things have been done better, where things have been done more efficiently, learn those lessons and be prepared to, uh, to, uh, to explore those lessons uh, more widely across Scotland. Pentland. So, again, Cabinet Secretary, I'll ask the question, do you think that public services reform is, is going to be slower because of budget cuts? Uh, there's no need for public service reform to be slower because of the financial situation. Public services reform is an imperative brought about by the reductions in public expenditure that we are facing and by the uh, changes in the population, and we have to respond to that with an imaginative agenda, which is what the government is taking forward. Mr. Wilson, and a supplementary on this point, and then I'll come back to you, Mr. Pentland. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. The supplementary is around the issue that John Pentland has just raised in terms of the, the constant cry we get for local government at the present moment, the squeezed in terms of financial pressures. Could the Cabinet Secretary give any comment on or any indication of the discussions that have been held with local authorities regarding the ongoing council tax freeze? and uh, additional £70 million being given to local authorities in Scotland and what issues are being raised by local authorities regarding uh, the council tax freeze? Well, the, 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 the council tax freeze was uh, a part of the spending review settlement that was agreed with local government and obviously, as I said in my opening remarks, um, it is entirely a decision by local government as to whether it, uh, it applies that council tax fees. We fund it, we make the resources available to enable that to, to be the case. Um, in terms of discussions with local government, um, I, I don't think we've discussed the council tax freeze since we agreed the settlement for 2013-14. 
and as I also indicated, we're now beginning to look at the 2014-15 settlement, so I'm, I'm sure we'll cover it in those discussions. Uh, at a general level, I think in terms of the quantum of local government funding and its, its, its relativities to the wider public sector, um, uh, between 2007-08 and 2012-13, the resources within the Scottish Government's control increased by 6.4%. Over the same period, local government's budget increased by 8.9%. So I think in terms of the uh, an assessment of the resources that are available for me to distribute, um, local government has actually done uh, better out of the funding settlements since 2007-08 than the Scottish Government has actually managed to do uh, as a consequence. Cabinet Secretary, to, to follow on from that question, is I'm, I'm aware that prior to the current squeeze, local authorities were asked to make 2% efficiency savings, and this was a continuing uh, trend from the previous Scottish Executive and carried over by the Scottish Government. Audit Scotland and the Audit Commission have quite clearly indicated they couldn't identify where those local authorities who were claiming to make, be making 2% efficiency savings, where these efficiency savings were being made. Is the current pressures on local government almost equivalent to those 2% efficiency savings that were being requested by a Scottish executive and the Scottish government? Well, well the, 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 the fundamental difference between the efficiency savings that were required by my predecessors and the efficiency savings that I have required is that uh, I have enabled local government to retain those efficiency savings within uh, their own resources. My predecessors assumed a, 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 an efficiency saving from local government and then removed it from the local government block to allocate to other public services. Now, I have never done that since I became the finance minister because I think it incentivises local authorities to, if they are retaining the, the, the benefits and the fruits of their efficiency savings, it will encourage um, a more efficient way of working. And I think the local government, I think, is, 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 is well able to evidence um, where it has made those efficiency savings and changes in practice in uh, delivery of services. Uh, I think we see that uh, in all of the communities that we represent, that public services are, are just deployed in a different fashion. And as a consequence, resources are saved uh, to the public purse. So I, I'm, uh, I, and we're living in a financial environment where there will be a continuing and recurring requirement to undertake efficiency savings to deal with the financial pressures that, with which we're all wrestling. Before I take you back, Mr Pentland, Dan McTaggart, please. Three tiny um, supplementary. Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned um, there about the council tax freeze and it being fully funded. Can you tell me, has the inflation been added to this amount that's been fully funded? Uh, well, the government's um, uh, assessment of what um, an increase of uh, the council tax may well have been um, has been... Um, £70 million, pounds, and we have applied that figure since 2007 8. Um, now, obviously, I should say 2008 9, uh, my apologies. Um, they, uh, clearly, in that period, the rate of inflation has varied quite significantly um, over that period, um, but uh, certainly my estimation is that £70 million pounds is uh, an adequate and an appropriate um, sum of money to reflect the, uh, the freezing of the council tax. Okay. Mr Pentland, please. Thank you, convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, what has been the real terms change in local government revenue and capital allocation since 2007? And you're probably aware there's been a health warning about the impact of ring fence funding being incorporated, the underfunded council tax freeze money, and the police and fire split. It would be useful then to know the cost of additional responsibilities added to the budget each year, because all these things are necessary to put the figures in context. The, um, I think the best thing I can uh, help Mr Pentland with, I think, is the proportion of the Scottish Government's um, revenue resources that we have at our disposal which, um, when we came to office in 2007-08, was 37.1% was the local government share of um, 
revenue resources available to the Scottish Government. And in 2013-14, um, that is estimated to be 37.6%. So um, that's higher than when we came to office. And again, I go back to the statistics that I quoted to um, Mr Wilson a moment ago. Um, the resources available to the Scottish Government um, in revenue resources uh, increased by 6.4% uh, between 2007-8 and 12-13, and over the same period, local government's budget increased by 8.9%. So these are, you know, I think it's indicative of strong financial settlements for local government, given the financial pressures that we, um, we, we, we face, and given the fact that I cannot allocate money that I don't actually have. Um, the second point is on capital, where um, the government gave local government a commitment that uh, we would maintain uh, local government's share of the total capital budget available to the Scottish Government at 28%. And that has been fulfilled. It's been a bit lumpy, I would acknowledge, because by agreement with local government, I reduced the capital allocations to local government in 12-13 and 13-14 because local authorities had borrowing powers, and they, which I didn't have, and I was facing enormous capital pressures. Um, but I will inflate the um, local government uh, budgets for capital expenditure by 120 million in 14-15 and 100 million in 15-16 um, to make good that uh, uh, change in profile. Um, but that was uh, agreed with local government, and I appreciated the the pragmatism of local government in recognising that um, uh, local authorities had borrowing powers and I didn't. And uh, by our joint endeavours, we could expand the capital resources available for the Scottish economy, which was a, a joint and shared priority. The Cabinet Secretary will know that you know it's, it's, it's all very well be, uh, providing capital capital monies, but if you don't have the revenue to support that, then you know you're in a, a no-win situation. Uh, can I then? Maybe move on to. Could I, could I perhaps, Kevin? I, 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 I think I better just um, just put some comments on the record in relation to that point. Uh, the capital figure I'm talking about is uh, is is capital Dell. This is hard capital expenditure. It requires no borrowing uh, requirement by local government. It is capital expenditure for local government to deploy. Now, the the borrowing um, was uh, the conditional on. £120 million and £100 million. Well, the availability of borrowing was recognised by local government as being something they could contribute towards capital um, uh, resource, capital investment within Scotland. Um, but it was undertaken on the realisation that what they lost over two years, they would gain over the subsequent two years. Um, so local government was no worse off as a consequence. Supplementary and McTaggart supplementary, and then back to Mr. Pentland. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning once again, Cabinet Secretary. Last week, the committee received evidence that showed that the decisions that were made by local government, uh, local authorities uh, prior to 2007 has meant additional financial pressures on those local authorities. And, and by that, I mean the PPP PFI uh, commitments that were given. And we see figures. Uh, we're presented with figures that clearly show that year on year till 2024-25, the amount being paid back to PPP PFI will increase substantially, uh, which I understand is a, takes away from the ability of local authorities to spend money because they actually entered into contracts with clauses that could not break, and therefore there is a greater squeeze from PFI PPP projects on those local authorities' spending commitments. Mr. Smiley. The, um, the, well, clearly, um, PFI commitments are commitments that, once they're entered into, they have to be honoured. Um, I've, exa I've examined whether or not it's possible to renegotiate these uh, contracts and to reduce the costs. Uh, I am satisfied uh, by the awfulness of the negotiation of these agreements that um, even if I was able to negotiate a better deal, I'd have to give large proportions of it back to the contractors that were involved in it and, and those who financed the deal. So these were terrible examples of negotiation that were undertaken. But, you know, Mr Wilson, just for the benefit of the record, um, in 2000 and, uh, 
2000-2001, the amount of the budget that was reserved for uh, PFI repayments was £70 million. Um, by the time I came to office in 2007-8, it was £510 million. Um, so, you know, there's a very substantial increase uh, in that type of activity. So, uh, I think the point, uh, th these are contracts that have to be honoured, and uh, I, I should stress that that number is, will not all be local government. Uh, I don't have a split of local government numbers in front of me just now, um, but um, uh, that would certainly be an ongoing financial commitment. Ms McTaggart. Cabinet Secretary, um, it would be remiss of me not to ask this. Um, we had received, the committee had received information about equal pay claims for local governments, and that there are still some outstanding um, Money in the past has been made available from Scottish Government to, to assist local government in trying to settle these claims. Is the funding still available to local government to settle them? The, um, as, as far as I recall, and I'll just, I, I, I will have to just, conf if I have to write to the committee, I will do so, but I am um, pretty certain that all local authorities have come to a deal with the, the relevant trade union, well, with the workforces on equal pay. That is not to say that the issues are all, have all gone away, because there will be, a, you know, clearly there's legal challenge that uh, that exists in some of these arrangements. But I'm pretty sure all authorities have come to that deal. But I will check that point and confirm it to the committee in writing if I need to afterwards. Um, in relation to the. Um, the, the, what the government has undertaken has been to negotiate with the Treasury um, some further borrowing capability for local authorities to deal with equal pay claims. Um, when I've offered these arrangements in the past, they haven't been fully utilised by local government. Um, so, but but I would I'm certainly, if it would assist local government, I'd be very happy to explore um, any further uh, initiatives that would assist in that respect. Thank you. Thanks. Mr Pentland. Uh, thank you. To go back to Mr Wilson's question, the Cabinet Secretary on PFI, and uh, I know it's high, highly unlikely that Scotland uh, will vote for separation next year. Uh, however, rather than assume, I must ask the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, what research he has undertaken regarding the impact on local government borrowing and credit ratings of the approaching referendum and possible independence. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm confident in the financial health of Scotland and of an independent Scotland that local authorities would be able to borrow um, at um, competitive and sustainable rates of interest, um, given the fact that we have strong public finances, that we contribute more to the United Kingdom than we receive back in return, given the fact that we have a, a balanced our budget um, throughout the devolution period, uh, demonstrating a, a, an ability which uh, has not been demonstrated by the United Kingdom government. And of course, any talk of credit ratings is is really very interesting in the current context, given the fact that uh, you know I've certainly received leaflets telling me that the United Kingdom can guarantee me a triple A credit rating, and um, surprise, surprise, I'm not receiving leaflets of that any longer, or certainly not delivered them to my house, um, because the UK has lost its triple A credit rating. So uh, I think that's quite illuminating. Margaret Mitchell, please. Just very briefly on equal pay, I understand Cabinet Secretary South Lanarkshire uh, Council is still maintaining it as a foolproof um, system and has had in place. That means that it isn't answerable. It's lost various appeals and I understand the case is now going to the Supreme Court and figures up to 200 million have been bandied about if, if this case is lost. Is there any circumstance where the Scottish Government would step in to protect taxpayers' money in, in these circumstances? The, these equal pay for local government is, is, is a matter entirely for local government. The, the local government are the employers of the individuals concerned. And obviously, as I answered to Anne McTaggart a moment ago, there may be legal challenge that emerges to some of the equal pay deals. If that is the case, um, then local government, um, uh, I would imagine, would be um, contesting those um, legal processes. Uh, of that, I'm absolutely certain. Um, and, uh, but, but dealing with any financial, possible financial consequences would be a matter for local government. Mr. 
when it's reaching these um, really quite outrageous proportions, way above any other for, um, local authority, just by maintaining they have a foolproof um, system in place? Well, the, 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 the local authorities will have negotiated these um, arrangements with the workforce, um, or, or will have applied those to their workforce, one of the two. Um, but local government is, are, are the employers of the individuals concerned and uh, it would be inappropriate of me to interfere in the issues about uh, pay and remuneration for local authority staff. I don't set local authority remuneration, I don't set pay policy for local government. It's entirely up to local government to take those decisions forward in the context of their financial settlements. Um, I, I, and obviously the question of equal pay has been negotiated by local government and, and, um, and they must uh, deal with that issue. We have a number of questions left. Yeah. Um, can we be very brief now and brief answers please, Cabinet Secretary? Can I ask you the government support to have of local authorities making use of alios? In, in, in the correct circumstances, there's nothing wrong with the use of alios. Um, I, I think they've, um, I think if I if I look at an example um, uh, of uh, you know, the leisure, leisure facilities, for example, in Perth and Kinross, where I live and represent, um, has been handled by, I think, what would be described as an alio um, for, my goodness, it must be the best part of 20 years, probably 20 years, and it works very successfully, and that's replicated in other parts of the country. Uh, I think there's been some elements of alio practice which have left a lot to be desired um, and I've acted to intervene to stop remuneration being paid to councillors who were on boards of alios, which I thought was completely inappropriate. Um, so there is, a, there is a proper place for alios. I think what a local authority has to satisfy itself about is that um, if it passes a function to an arm's length organisation that the governance arrangements are appropriate and strong and that the accountabilities are appropriate and strong, uh, particularly if there is public money involved and public interest involved. Uh, some of these alloys are, have trust and charitable status and, and therefore don't pay um, non-domestic rates. Is, is, is that correct, Cabinet Secretary, and it, is that a good use of money? Well, it's, it's correct. Um, it can certainly, um, it, it certainly means that uh, they're not paying business rates if, they're, if they've got charitable status, and that's obviously an issue for me and another part of my responsibilities on, on non-domestic rates. But I, I quite understand the, the motivation why uh, some functions that are undertaken, that have historically been for undertaken by local authorities, are more appropriately taken forward under a charitable umbrella, and that can open up other funding streams to undertake. Um, uh, refurbishments and redesign of, of services and premises that uh, ordinarily would not be able to be afforded by the traditional local government finance. You mentioned the accountability of alios and, and you'll be aware that Audit Scotland, um, I think, raised some concerns about the performance of, of some of these organisations. Are you um, satisfied that right checks and balances are in place to hold them accountable, make sure they're fully transparent and, and that um, things are being carried out as they should be? It's, it, you know, my, the, the supervision of local government and the issues that um, uh, are involved in that on, on these questions is, is, is properly a matter for the Accounts Commission and Audit Scotland. So it's not, it's not a, an issue for, for, for me to be satisfied about. The Accounts Commission and Audit Scotland must be satisfied about these points. What I would say is that I think local authorities must be mindful of the importance of ensuring that the governance and accountability arrangements are absolutely correct if they are going down this route. Uh, finally, Cabinet Secretary, a number of witnesses have referred to Lord Rock and directly employed local authority staff since 2010. For example, the Accounts Commission reported, report highlights a reduction of 14,100 full-time equivalent posts. Do you have figures on how many of these job losses have actually been transferred to Alios? I don't have those figures in front of me, Mrs Mitchell, but if I can find them, I, I will certainly pass them to the committee. We'd be grateful for that. Appreciate Cabinet Secretary. Mr Pentland, please, <coughs> briefly, and brief answers, please. Very quickly. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, with the high street uh, shops and businesses closing, uh, can, can, can you describe the government's approach to non-domestic rates, in particular the rationale behind its forecasting for increases 
in NDRI in 2013-14 and 2014-15 as set out in the 2013-14 draft budget? The um, approach to non-domestic rates is essentially um, a, a calculation which involves assessing the, um, the valuation base, which is um, a product of the independent valuation that was undertaken and applied in 2010. Um, we apply um, an inflation increase to the uh, non-domestic rates poundage based on the um, level of RPI, RPI at uh, September in each year. We make an assessment of the level of buoyancy within the, um, uh, the economy and how much we expect increased economic activity to contribute towards non-domestic rates. Uh, we make an assessment of the cost of relief, such as the small business bonus, and we also make an assessment of the likely uh, losses through appeals, which are, of course, a constant feature of the revaluation period uh, that, uh, that we're currently in. And very briefly, if, if you believe then, if your forecasts are wrong, uh, do you have any contingency plans in place that would obviously fill the black hole? Gap that may appear. Uh, the, 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 the government um, makes its best assessment of non domestic rates. Um, the, the funds that uh, are held um, uh, surrounding non domestic rates sometimes start the financial year in credit, sometimes they start the financial year in debit. Uh, I'm confident in the estimations that I have made of non domestic rates um, and um, the resources that are required in the budget, uh, I think, will be delivered by the uh, rates realised under the non-domestic rates uh, process. Okay. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, final question uh, from myself, and I'm sure it will come as uh, no surprise to you what I'm about to ask you. Uh, we cannot really discuss uh, local government budgets, in my opinion, without talking about the funding formula. Um, you have said previously uh, that if COSLA uh, were wanting to review uh, or requested a review of that formula uh, that your door would be open. Uh, can I ask if COSLA uh, have indicated whether they would like to see uh, a review of the local government funding formula uh, and uh, is your door still open? Uh, my, my door is still open. Um, COSLA have um, uh, not requested a review of the local government funding formula and the when these issues were considered around the spending review in 2011, um, the very strong message I received from local government was that they wanted stability around the funding formula. Uh, thank you. That means I'll maybe have to go and talk to Cosla. Uh, thank you very much for your evidence uh, here today, uh, Cabinet Secretary, Mr Stitt, Mr Holmes. Uh, I now suspend this meeting for about five minutes for a change of witnesses.
thank you very much. We now move on to our final panel. Um, I'd like to welcome Gavin Stevenson, Chief Executive of Dumfries and Galloway Council and Member of Solace. Welcome back uh, to giving evidence to the committee, Mr Stevenson. Alec McPhee, Director of Finance at East Ayrshire Council and Alan Puckran, Director of Finance at Inverclyde Council. Um, would you like to make some opening remarks, gentlemen? Um, the first thing I'd like to say is, is very much we, would, we welcome the Cabinet Secretary's approach in trying to smooth the um, initial impact of the uh, reductions in public finances over the last couple of years. Certainly as a, as a Chief Executive on the border, I've seen the impact of the short, sharp shock in Cumbria, Carlisle and Newcastle, where I regularly meet. And I think um, the longer uh, term planning approach is, is bearing fruit. In, in the fact that uh, well-kent services still exist uh, across in Gretna that don't no longer exist in, in Carlisle. Um, I think moving forward, there's going to be a long time uh, before public finances recover. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we maintain an ongoing dialogue with the government, particularly in development of policy around the costs and, importantly, the impact of policy, but also consequential decisions that new policy might bring as, as funding goes down to make sure, um, I think, that we don't end in five years' time with a postcode lottery of service delivery across Scotland from individual decision-making, which might be priority-based, but you could end up with different eligibility for services or care across well, to, 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 uh, to our public, you know, invisible boundaries of, of, of local authority areas. I'm not saying that, but that's where you might end up. But so I think it's about that constant ongoing dialogue, not just about how the impact of that policy, but what consequentially might mean to, to put it in if it's not fully costed. I think moving forward, the changes that we're facing um, and, to get, and to make sustainable services need um, radical um, and, uh, and changes and need to challenge existing models of delivery. Um, very much those with local government background will know that is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Change is difficult in a local authority context. Um, when suddenly services that have not been used suddenly become vital um, with the placards. And I think that, that that's, that's and, and I don't think across the political spectrum of the public they're quite there yet, and certainly some of the examples that, that I've been experiencing. But I think we need to take them there in the development of that process. Health and social integration presents a fantastic opportunity for us to develop models of governance. And I heard earlier talking about governance of values. Uh, models of governance that work, give security, but also new ways of delivery, new ways of, of, of empowering our frontline staff to, to act and think differently um, with the safety that they've got, uh, uh, security around them. That's going to be absolutely invaluable in securing the confidence of the public and our communities that radical change or changes of model is not threatening. Everybody is resistant to change, but given the, the scale um, particularly in health and social care with the demographic, that, that we need to be demonstrating that a lot of the decision-making can be taken close to our, our, our communities and in our communities, and some of our answers lie in the community, not in the central model, as we've had in the past. But that will take time to build that confidence. Finally, where possible, um, as, a, as a chief officer, I would say this, some certainty in the numbers. The, the system doesn't react well to changing particularly in year, and I think that we have benefited in Scotland from having uh, a greater certainty than our colleagues in England in, in some of the numbers. And certainly moving forward into 14-15, just holding to the pre-announced numbers is, is really important for planning, but beyond. And I think we all have the elephant in the room of the cut, the 10% cut to local government announced um, for England and Wales for 2015. How that will impact, that could be a significant, and, and the longer time we have to plan such a, a reduction would be important. But certainly, with, uh, looking at my colleagues today, we've not really been engaging in conversations about what that might mean if it does come our way uh, with central government. I think it's important that we don't pretend it doesn't exist. It will come through the barnet consequential at some point. And if it does result in that, then the longer we have got to plan how we would work together, how we might accelerate more radical models of service delivery to protect our priority areas in Scotland, I think, would be important. But I think it's just to say that, that any degree of certainty, as an officer, the longer horizon we've got, the, the easier it is to engage with our communities and with our frontline staff to, to deliver the right answer, which I think is what we're all looking for. Thank you.
Do Mr. Puckran or Mr. McPhee want to add anything to that opening statement? Mr. McPhee. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I wonder if it might be helpful to, to the committee just to hear the, the kind of things we've been doing locally in East Ayrshire to try to combat the, the position we are currently facing. We've looked at um, a best case scenario of a flat cash grant settlement until 2017, and that 2017 coincides with the next local government elections. And we estimate that that would mean we'd have a savings, an annual recurring savings requirement by then of £37 million. Um, that essentially comes from inflation alone, not, not demand pressures from, from uh, elderly care and so on. Um, so what we've, we've done is identify the, the strategic imperatives we need to, need to stick to over that period rather than, than uh, immediately launch into uh, salami slicing cuts packages. We're trying to focus our resources on what it is that's most important. So we've looked at uh, making sure we're outcomes based. The things which are important in our single outcome agreement need to be the ones which are important in our budget. Uh, and anything which is not attached to that really has to be questioned closely. We've looked to deliver with communities rather than for communities. We're engaging very closely with um, um, organisations across the area to look at whether we may transfer services or assets to them. And we're getting a fairly positive response from that, I have to say. Partly, I think, because of the engagement we, we, we undertook to make it and make them aware of why we were in this position and how we had to, to move forward together to get ourselves out of it. Prevention, again, part of our prevention strategy is making sure that any investment in, in preventative spend uh, can be evidence that we will, the savings will actually materialise at some point in the future. Um, clearly, with equality issues, as every council does, right across uh, our area, um, sustainability has been the key to make sure that by the time we get to 2017, our, our organisations have a size and have a focus which can live within those reduced uh, funds. We've been looking closely at alternative delivery models. Alios is, is one option we have looked at. Shared services with neighbouring authorities. We are um, examining at the moment a road shared service for Ayrshire, which looks fairly promising. But I have to say, things we've looked at in the past, have, when we've get, got to the final hurdle of finance, haven't delivered the kind of savings we've expected when we set out. Um, and asset management, where um, we, we are sticking to the, the Scottish Futures Trust target of 25% reduction in buildings seeing how we can do that, and part of that will, will inevitably mean rationalisation of school buildings, which are about 67% occupied at the moment across East Ayrshire. We have a tag of 85%. So those are the kind of things we're looking at, trying to protect frontline services whilst transforming the way the Council delivers services and, and who it delivers them to. Simple question then, Mr McPhee. You've outlined a number of, a number of areas which you're working on. Um, are you carrying out um, a zero-based, priority-based, whatever you want to call it, budgeting exercise right across all services? Is that what you're describing to me? Or is it um, bits and pieces here and there? We have a range of work streams which we're looking at, rather than going back to basics, which evidence suggests is not always that effective. We have a range of work streams. We're looking at um, property and estate rationalisation, energy efficiency, terms and conditions for employees. It's um, so bad to go back to the baseline and build up from the baseline, can I ask? Well, I think there are, there are some services which will always be required, no matter um, how much investigation you, you undertake of them. I understand that, Mr McPhee, but, you know, uh, that's going back to the base and automatically looking at what your statutory obligations are and what is actually required. Well, I think in that respect, what we're looking at is what we are trying to achieve through our single outcome agreement and making sure that our resources are, are clearly focused on those and making sure what we do is as efficient as possible through benchmarking, looking at good practice across other authorities. Um, what we do have is an annual detailed review of each, each uh, service budget. Uh, Chief Executive and myself go through line by line, sometimes invoice by invoice, questioning why expenditure has taken place in the previous financial year and taking out those, those kind of spurious costs for the future. Thank you. Can I ask Mr Stevenson or Mr Puckran if Dumfries and Galloway uh, or Inverclyde are looking at a priority-based budgeting exercise to, to deal with the future? I've got to be careful the language. Uh, Zero-based budgeting, I would ask the committee to show me where it's been done, because actually it's a huge exercise that misses the political prerogative in the government. Priority-based budgeting yeah. is a different matter. We've, been, we, we've put together an activity-based budgeting book, which puts each activity, costs, benchmarking, where it relates to outcomes, before our members. 
the, the, the problem with that is it's almost like a huge amount of information. It's difficult for the members to get their head and we have to explain to them and, and they're getting used to it. The information's all out there. The, the challenge is presenting that in such a way in which the political priorities to move forward can clearly be reflected because you can have priorities to protect the vulnerable. But when you get down to issues like closing the estate, probably we'll spend as much officer time trying to close a village hall in Newton Stewart as I would taking two million pounds of the education budget. Um, so I think that, that yes, the information is there. Members are actually, I think it's taken out into this year and certainly now with a, a majority administration. That's a very, they're very difficult documents if you don't have a majority. I, I think that, that, that we found to move forward. So the information is there and what we're finding with a majority administration now is that it's a very effective tool for them to, to, to start actually dealing with the size of the scale that we've got because it's all there in front of them. The staff, the workforce, the assets, the benchmarking information, um, the, the priorities that the spend links to is all available to them. So it's, it's very much helping. But I think we also need to recognise that putting that sort of information in the middle of a table in a minority administration is, that does not help for a consensus budget. But we need to work our way through that political challenge. In, in other councils. But it was when I had a minority, it was not a useful document. Now that I've got a majority administration, it's a very useful document. Mr. Puckerin. Um, thank you. I, I would concur with, with Gavin that um, zero based budgeting, taking it back, all the budgets back to that, is such a hugely intensive process from resources that, that by and large councils don't have, that you are looking at a sort of a mixed bag approach. There are certain areas um, along the lines of asset management, both in terms of the school estate, the office estate, a depot's estate, etc., where you do build from the bottom up and say, what do we require over the next 20 plus years? Um, and we've done that in Inverclyde. Um, and, and, but there's other ones where what you're looking at in terms of priorities, and particularly given the financial settlements, is, is about priorities about what you're going to stop doing. And as a result, when we're considering savings, every individual saving, you know, there's got to be some commentary in there about how it links with our single outcome agreement, what the impact are on vulnerable groups, etc. And that all feeds in on an individual saving by saving basis. Thank you. I find it very interesting that uh, Mr. McPhee is describing more or less priority based budgeting within a service, but not corporately. Um, I may come back to that, but I've got other members uh, who want to come in. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, and then it will be Anne McTaggart, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and it's uh, pleasing to hear that uh, our officials are looking as far forward as they are. Indeed, uh, Mr. Puckman said the next 20 years, uh, and Mr. McPhee referred uh, to the planning up to 2017 council elections. In that context, and uh, given that the majority of the committee and the majority of the parliament are uh, working on a project to substantially increase the powers that are exercised closer to communities by uh, assuming the normal powers of an independent country. That, in turn, of course, will lead to uh, additional responsibilities in this place and the devolving of responsibilities from this place to uh, local authorities and, indeed, um, uh, powers that uh, may be acquired from Westminster may bypass this place and go straight to local authorities. I, I think in particular in social services there would be clear uh, economies and reasonable things to do there and perhaps in employment services. But my question is, is very simply, uh, given that 2016-17, uh, which has been referred to, would be the first year post-independence, albeit a year, I suspect, of consolidation rather than radical change. What thinking have you been doing uh, to identify what additional powers it would be good to get that would serve the public sector reform agenda, that would serve uh, the agenda of taking powers closer to communities? Um, and and, and how, far, how far have you got and what are your plans for doing further thinking? First. Mr. Stevenson. To answer the political question, um, because that it, it, it's an if. Um, it's an if. And this can go two I ways. Think, I'm not think trying we, to ask a political question. Can I say that? Y yes, I understand. But I think that, that the point you make about we need to be devolving power to our communities is absolutely the heart of the health and social care integration work. Um, I think that we have issues of capacity. I think all all uh, members will recognise that they have empowered communities. 
but they have disadvantaged communities, communities that are not ready to take some of the, uh, the development of the social enterprise and we need to build the capacity in those communities and that varies. So I think the planning that, that most authorities are doing is how can we create, how can we use our community capacity building with our community planning partners better? Because effectively a lot of the work we've been doing is building capacity in, in areas such, a very important areas such as, as healthy weight, collaboratives, etc. But the real capacity we need to deal with at this point is how do we empower our communities to look after themselves? How do we connect the third sector to start delivering services for their communities, by their communities, and, and creating that model? Now, that comes with real com complexities around how sustainable can some of these organisations be? How do you not just pass on bureaucracy? The rules of Oscar are very difficult when it comes to, tra to, to councils providing support in, say, legal, law and admin, things that we're very good at. So those are the complexities. So there is considerable muck uh, around that. On a more national level, I know that our organisation is considering one of its work streams for its development uh, two days this week about the exact issues that you're talking about because we need to prepare. But I think the real issue for us is how do we create capacity within our communities to be able to take more of it on in a pure cost sense, and an old-fashioned accountant would come out in me, the cost base of local government is high. It's, and, and therefore, a straight full cost for some of our third sector is a saving to the public purse. The counter side to that, which I think we need to be aware of, particularly for a rural economy like mine, you then replace a high-paid job with a lower-paid job and has a consequential impact on our economy. Dumfries used to pride itself on being one of the lowest unemployment areas. It's now one of the highest. But actually, the jobs that we are creating are in the care sector and the jobs we're leaving in manufacture. So it's a complex issue. But to me, with an elderly mother, I want her to, to access services in her community provided by her community so she doesn't have to leave her community. That's crucial to me and crucial to my mother. We are, I still think, a couple of years off having certainty in models that can do that, but the clock is ticking. And certainly that probably fills up a vast proportion of my day with my colleagues and I'm sure my colleagues as well. So that's, that's the work that's underway. And I think if we can do it for health, why couldn't it be applied to other services such as street cleaning to support local communities and other local community services that we could look out to commission out into the communities rather than, than local government provision? But we have complex issues with the trade unions, you can imagine, in those debates. Please. Thanks, convener. Um... It's a question about the council tax freeze, and given that this committee has received a fair deal of evidence to say that there's no salami left to be sliced, um, could the panel members explain to uh, the, the committee about how what, what has been the impact of the council tax freeze? And if you were here earlier and you would have heard the cabinet secretary implying that the £70 million pounds that it does show to local authorities is sufficient. Um, do you feel the same? I think as, a, as an officer, we have to deal with the taxation base we've got. I think we've been on record as saying the council tax freeze, although politically good, doesn't fit into a progressive tax system. It also, I think, had a real issue where you were in the council tax comparative ladder at the time that it came in. So, to recent Galloway was the lowest mainland council tax. So, we, we were significantly disadvantaged if we were at the middle. So, there was no, you know, because of decisions that were taken before it came in. However, you know, I think that when you're talking about the 70 million, whether or not it's indexed inflation, my colleagues here will give you details. It's almost at the margins of the issues that we want to deal with. I think that the difficulty is that when it comes to having to deal with some of the difficult balancing act issues, the lack of the flexibility to do that, which might be acceptable to a local population, is a difficult issue when you're coming to put that before you. Um, but certainly, I think for De Vries and Galloway, the difference between us where we got fixed, and the, the average council tax in Scotland is about four and a half million pounds a year to me, which is about half my annual savings target. So therefore, it, it does present a challenge. Whether or not it's enough, the 70 million was set at the time um, when it came up, but of course it would depend upon the council's appetite for where it wanted to set its local taxation. So I think it would, it would, that would depend upon the political view in it. But, but certainly it has taken a tool out of the toolkit for, uh, for uh, uh, I would say that would allow us to have mitigated some of the impacts 
to, to this point and some of the impacts moving forward, particularly when we might have been able to put options before the electorate for where they might wish to, to take the choice. And that uh, you've got a fine balancing act here in terms of trying not to stray into the political. Mm. Mr. Puckran, do you want to, Thank, to go th next? Thank you. I, I think there's two points. Firstly, just to clarify for the committee, because I was in, uh, listening to the Cabinet Secretary earlier, um, we've got a flat cash settlement, so the 70 million is within the flat cash. It's not over and above the flat cash settlement. Um, the, the impact, um, I, again, I would agree with Gavin, it, it's, it's not the panacea. If, if, if councils were able to increase their council tax, it's not the panacea to close the budget gaps because there are considerable pressures on councils, inflationary, demographic, etc. However, it does give another tool for us to use um, as a director of finance. The more flexibility I am afforded to use my professional expertise to balance a budget, then probably I would say the better job I can do for my council and the, and, and the people who, who live there. Um, as an example, um, Inverclyde set a three-year budget in February of this year. Obviously, there was a degree of estimation in there as to future settlements, but we did assume a council tax freeze. We have a funding gap of £18 million at the time. Um, a 2% increase year on year council tax in, in council tax would have closed a million pounds of that 18 million pound gap. So it still would have left 17 million pounds for us to deal with. So that just gives you some idea of the, of the scale of it. Um, but it would maybe take the edge off some of the more difficult savings if members do end up with a, with a decision uh, when they get to the really difficult savings. Well, would it be worthwhile potentially increasing council tax to deal with that? That flexibility doesn't exist at the moment. Of, uh, for us to get an indication, if you were to raise the average band D uh, council tax in your local authority by a pound, how much would that actually raise? In Aberdeen, I believe it's around about the £80,000 mark. How, what would it be in, in, uh, in Inverclyde? Be, be around about thirty thousand pounds. Yeah, Mr. Stevenson and Dumfries and Galloway. Do you know? I'm trying to think, we are twice the size. It's probably about sixty-five, seventy thousand. To make fee. It's about fifty thousand. Right. Okay. That gives the committee a fair indication of what's uh, going on there. Mr. McPhee, do you want to go back to Miss McTaggart's question and add your thoughts? Um, it, it clearly is a political decision, but the, the, the 70 million is over six years, so it is six times 70 million, which is now uh, not there. And it's, it's simply a political decision how that money otherwise could have been spent. So I don't think I've anything further to add to what my colleagues have said. Okay. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, please. Good morning, gentlemen. You may have heard me asking the Cabinet Secretary about local authorities' use of alios. Can I ask if you use these in your individual local authorities? If so, could you give examples of how? And are you in a position to say how many um, local authority staff have been uh, previously directly employed by the local authority have been transferred to alios? Like to start. I don't. My <coughs> council doesn't use uh, use an alio. However, moving forward, as we say, as a tool, if there are non-domestic rates that prevents additional cuts in social work, then we may have to put that as a proposal before our members. But I think it's 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 not really a, a financial decision. It's very much a political decision because it does involve the transfer of staff and and the, and the arm's length removal of cherished assets. So I think those are issues that we would need to consider in, in taking it forward. I think the issue of using an alio, I think there's two issues you need to separate. What's the reason that you're using it? If it's purely to get a non-domestic rates, then, you, then perhaps you're not fully fulfilling the reason that there needs to be about getting better outcomes for the money that you're able to put in. So I think there are issues that perhaps uh, uh, councils in the past have, have moved towards it without the, the full understanding of the implications um, because they are still the public's assets, so therefore you can't remove the decision-making process fully and the impact on it back to the council. But, but certainly I'm in the middle of such a debate in my council and it is, a, it is a difficult and challenging debate. But if the rules state as they are, then my finance colleagues professionally have no option but to recommend that, that the council currently, my council is paying potentially a million pounds in rates that it doesn't necessarily have to. So I think that that's, that 
th that could be a persuasive argument moving forward. But for me, it would need to be about how do you create sustainable services moving forward if they are arm's length from the council. As only before I ask the other two um, the same question, as the only chief executive on the panel, do you know if Solace has um, the figures about these jobs being transferred? No, that, that any such information would be available through COSLA. We, we, we're an organisation just of the, the, the senior officers. No, we don't gather the, the statistics, but that information, uh, there are um, workforce returns submitted, I think, that, would, that should be able to clear that within the accounts. But certainly, I, I don't think it would be a difficult job for COSLA to create such information. OK. Mr Buckran. Thank you. Um, within Inverclyde, we've uh, effectively created two alios. Um, um, the first one was Inverclyde Leisure, which was our leisure trust, which has been in existence for 12 years. That involved about 200 employees going over. That has, you know, proven to be successful. Um, and to the extent that we've had a subsequent transfer of the community facilities on top of the sports facilities, and there's plans now for the outdoor leisure facilities to transfer over as, as well. And I would say that probably the main advantage is over and above the financial advantage of the non-domestic rates um, has been around the, the sort of nimbleness of maybe decision-making, an element of commercial, um, extra commercial edge that they can bring etc and attraction of third um, of, of external funding as well the other one um, I would class as a, as a sort of alio was formed because of the housing stock transfer in Inverclyde we transferred our housing stock back in 2007 and that involved about 300 employees on the housing side and the building services side going over Just on to Mr Murphy have you got information on the amount of resources that have been saved by transferring the jobs or by other savings and how have these um, resources been redeployed? Um, thank you again. Um, two, two specific issues on this. One is that the amount of money we are paying in Verclyde Leisure now is less than the amount of money we were paying them in 2001. So when you think about the passage of time and inflation, because they've gained extra money um, through uh, direct charging by expanding gyms and, and facilities, etc. Um, so they, they brought that to the table. And by the same token, in the budget that we just set, we were able to reduce our management fee to Inverclyde Leisure by about a quarter of a million pounds without impacting on the direct service delivery. And that's due to savings they've been able to make, et cetera. So from that perspective, it has been successful. You come in, Mr. McPhee. Stuart McMillan, is this a supplementary on what Mr. Puckerin has just said? Uh, it is, yes. OK, yeah, on you go then. Thank you. Then. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi there. Um, Mr. Puckerin, when you mentioned there a moment ago regarding the nimbleness of uh, decision making, uh, Mr. Stevenson had a, a big smile across his face, uh, and I'm just uh, curious as to as to why that actually, uh, why he actually uh, kind of reacted that way. Um, is, it, is there a, a suggestion that um, that there is a, a lack of um, uh, speed in terms of decision making within local authorities? Mr. Stevenson, I need to remember my telly. Um, I think that one of the one of the um, one of the issues is that in a large bureaucracy such as the council, you would then enter into a debate about the importance of a local leisure centre in context of social work in schools, etc. So you end up in a far more complex debate than on the commercial stroke financial merits of that one individual bit. And, and, and therefore, and particularly with the emotive issue that relates around leisure, sport and community facilities, you end up in a debate that, that invariably, in my experience, ends up with a call for further information. Um, so, so you tend to put it on, and I see that you recognise that as well. And I think that, 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 that in a council, councils have ended up with a range of services that if you'd started at the beginning, you probably wouldn't have ended up being in there. And I think issues that benefit from that, that commercial focus, and, and, and et cetera, I think what's been proven, some of the, the, the alios, what's best if they're allowed that commercial freedom. But it, it certainly, I, I, I seem to, you know, that just brought back memories of endless debates about trying to close a leisure centre in one particular place, or even invest in a leisure centre in one particular place, was far longer than a school closure discussion. And to go back to uh, Mrs Mitchell's original question, please. <clears throat> we have uh, one long-standing uh, alley one leisure centre in Coman, 25 years old, very successful, very efficient. Um, and from 1st of July this year, we'll be outsourcing the remainder of our cultural and, and sporting facilities to a new uh, East Ayrshire Leisure Trust. 
Um, the advantages we see are, are, are similar to what Mr Perkin has described. Um, certainly there are rate savings around a, a million pounds a year, which is helpful to the overall council budget position, but um, we're able to attract people to the Trust Board who have um, detailed expertise in culture and sport. Um, and that's been, again, a very successful uh, recruitment campaign to, to achieve that. Um, and <clears throat> the, we, we expect a, a closer focus on, on what they are doing. They don't have this, the same um, chatter around other services. They are able to focus specifically on leisure and culture. And I have to say the staff who are transferring, over 200 staff, um, appear to be very positive about the move. Um, their terms and conditions will be protected and um, the Council will have to be con consulted if any change to those terms and conditions have been considered by the Trust in the future. Asking a little bit about accountability, the Cabinet Secretary said it really wasn't his responsibility, it was very much the local authorities. Given the Accounts uh, Commission's concern about some of the operation of Alios, um, can you give me some information of how you achieved this in, in your local authority? Did was <clears throat> we looked at the audit, audit Scotland's report on Alios, which came out um, some months ago. Um, that included a range of best practice, which was, should be adopted, and we, we made sure we uh, adopted all of that. We have um, five local authority councillors on the board, with uh, two myself and director of neighbourhood services as non-voting members, together with six um, external. Um, trustees who've only recently been recruited and um, there'll be no payment for, for holding those offices um, and we have engaged the, the services of um, a consultant who has been through over the, the course a couple of times before with other trusts. So as something which has been uppermost in our mind to make sure that, that, the, the, that there's transparency and accountability of uh, the trustees to the local community and back to the council. Mr. Parker. Um, in, a, in a similar way, um, we'll have councillors on both our River Clyde Homes, the housing body, and on River Clyde Leisure, and obviously they're supported by officers as, as well. However, on a, on a broader context, we've got a, an external governance uh, framework in the council that reports to the relevant committees and the overarching policy and resources committee, where not just the alios, but those major suppliers, in particular on the social care side, who we deal with, given what's happened with some care homes quite recently. There's been quite a number who've obviously got into financial difficulties that we have regular meetings on the client side where we look at both the financial position the governance are these organizations meeting if you're meeting with some of the smaller community groups which are vital to the delivery of services but sometimes they struggle to maybe organize meetings or they're struggling financially you want to get an early heads up that those things are happening so you can maybe help and support them and that information is reported back to committee as well as on the qualitative side so the alios are part of a far bigger framework in the way that we monitor these organizations councillors paid for being on the alios or the officials and uh, no. no thank you uh john wilson please can, can i just follow up a couple of questions from the questions Margaret mitchell's raised in terms of alios and uh mr mcphee you indicated that uh, potential saving to the council of a million pounds by transferring services to Analio. How are these savings being made up? Well, that initial million pounds is purely non-domestic rates. <clears throat> so it's through the non-payment of non-domestic rates the savings are going to be made. So it's, it's just it's so we can clarify where these savings are being made. And if it's because they're not paying non-domestic rates, then there's savings being made, but it has a consequence in other uh, forms of income uh, elsewhere. Mr. Puckton, you indicated in terms of Riverside Homes, uh, you know, the transfer in 2007, you indicated that the board was made up of uh, members, councillors. Can I just clarify whether or not the councillors are in the majority in that board? In, in neither in the Clyde Leisure or River Clyde Homes, the council is in the majority. Ask then, convener Mr. McPhee and Mr. Puckerin, how the accountability of how the boards operate when there is not a majority of elected members on these boards, and how that accountability then translates itself into reporting back to the local authority, where the local authority is, in many respects, uh, the major funder of these organisations. Mr. Puckerin, if you want to go first, and then Mr. McPhee. 
Thank you. In terms of Inverclyde Leisure, obviously the, the key accountability is that Inverclyde Council is putting £1.8 million a year into Inverclyde Leisure, so we've got a responsibility in terms of following the public pound. The reporting back um, comes back from, from the, the board members and the, the officers who support them, um, but obviously it's an independent body. They can make their own decisions, but we want to ensure that those decisions uh, don't expose the council and its funding at all. Uh, in terms of River Clyde Homes, obviously the council doesn't give any direct funding for them. We've just got elected members on the board. And again, we, 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 our, uh, our support there and our interest there is to, is to try and ensure that what River Clyde Homes is doing fits in with the wider community planning objectives of social housing in Inverclyde. You know, I'm aware Mr. McPhee's indicated earlier that when the transfer is going to take place to, in terms of East Ayrshire, they're going to put a condition in that any changes to terms and conditions of staff that transfer must be brought back to the council before these changes can take place. Mr Puckering, can I ask you directly, has there been any differential in terms and conditions for the staff that were transferred to the leisure services and to the housing services compared to that, well, it would be difficult in terms of housing services, but compared to that and other leisure services and other council departments? If you could highlight positives and negatives, if such things exist, please. Thank you. Uh, what I would stress at the outset is obviously there's a separate negotiations with unions take place uh, when it comes to Inverclyde Ledger. It's a completely separate body. Uh, I am pleased to say that um, you know, on, on the positive side, Inverclyde Council adopted the living wage uh, in November this year, and Inverclyde Ledger are doing so from April. And so, so that has gone through. That wasn't a condition or anything. You know, we've got no, we've got uh, no sanction over them if they didn't do that. But it does show that changes that have occurred in the council have been passed on to the employees there, as well. There are differences at the moment um, in terms of job evaluation. In that, in that the councils have, have adopted single status in job evaluation. Inverclyde Leisure hasn't uh, got that adopted as as yet. So that's where there are some differences that occur. Um, uh, the final thing I would say is when it comes to Inverclyde Leisure, one of the board members is the, the lead trade union representative for the employees as well. Uh, sorry, Convener, I don't want to... Yeah. There are a number of questions that arise out of that, but I want to move on to the main questions that I wanted to ask the panel. And Do you want Mr McPhee to come back with some yep. of the... Yeah, yeah and accountability, um, Convener. The, um, the, the way we're going to look at it is the... The, the trust will require to have a business plan um, approved by the, the, the council um, before the year begins and a two-year budget which will cover that, that business plan period. There will then be regular reports back to the council on how it's performing against those, those targets before the, the next budget review takes place. So there is a clear link between what the, the trust is doing, what the council expects it to do and how it's performing against those expectations all, all the way through. Thank you, Convener. To move on to my main questions, Convener, the, do the panel think the local government settlements that have been awarded over the last couple of years have been fair or uh, unfair in comparison to other uh, government departments? And particularly Mr Stevenson, I uh, was interested in his comments earlier when he made reference to a neighbouring authority south of the border and some of the local government settlements are being faced south of the border. And how would you compare those settlements in Scotland with the Scottish Government and those uh, elsewhere? I know that, again, you're on that uh, yes. uh, <laughs> fine line, gentlemen. Uh, Mr I, Stevenson. I, I, would, I would say that, that certainly the, the model in England, which was a short, sharp 15% cut in the one year, has impacted on services that you can see. I think Carlyle care homes were getting shut, etc. Museums were getting closed. Um, teachers were teachers being made redundant. So I think there's there's there's, there's it, absolutely the the governments have, have the right to to implement that. But I think that the pace and speed that that was brought in, there was no alternative to glorified salami slicing, but not salami, but big chunks. So I think that 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 was clearly a model that came through. As I said, that certainly the, the, the view in Scotland is that we were given certainty in the spending review to the figures, and that allowed us, that was very helpful in providing the planning. Uh, I would say that, 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 that Solace is, is preparing a, a submission to the committee, uh, given the time and, and the foresight. And we, we would say that one of the questions we've still got is about 
the difference between the NHS and the local government settlement, that, 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 that we, we still don't see the full justification for the, ra for the, the supported rise for, for the NHS. Um, in comparison to many of the services that consequentially end up in, in local government as well. And since there was a, there was a pay freeze for both sides, we, and we, we were struggling to see where uh, the, the, the great inflation was coming from, though it was being mentioned. So I think there's just, we would ask for greater clarity around that in moving forward, so that we don't end up having to have complex negotiations with NHS staff, with two groups of uh, staff with slightly different views of, of, of importance, but that's a political matter. So I think it was just about, it was difficult for us as officers to be explaining to our elected members when setting the budgets why there was such a fundamental difference in the allocations between the two sectors um, beyond the, the, the general that the health service needed more. So I think that was, that was the one issue. Again, we'd, I, I would restate my point that we just need, it's a consistency of the numbers. Give us that three year planning horizon with whatever number it is, and, and there, is, there is enough talent within the local government finance community to plan to do that properly over that phase. Most of the significant changes we're talking about will take at least two years to embed in. And the money's moving out. So therefore, what we, 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 would, we would desperately look is not to have a big hit in one year because that would be very difficult given the planning times to get it in. But certainly recognise that, that if that needs to come in, the longer planning horizon the more, the more ability local government and its partners will have to, to be able to deal with it. Thank you. It's hard to argue that um, maintaining a share of, of the pot, whether that pot's going up or down, isn't fair. Um, I think there needs to be some context around the, the increasing pressures on local government budgets. Obviously, the preventative agenda, there's a high expectation that local government will provide the prevention and that requires funding out with the, the change funding. Obviously, there's a question uh, uh, in the earlier session about that. Over and above the change fund funding, councils are putting money into early years or into elderly care, etc., to try and address the preventative agenda, to take the pressure off other parts of the, the public sector budgets. Um, and whether that's adequately recognised in the medium term in, in, in the funding, I think, will be one of the key challenges. I would have to say, I think, a, a major assistance has been the the significant reduction in ring fencing. I think the more flexibility, I go back to the point I made about council tax, the more flexibility that local government can have in setting its budgets and determining its priorities, then I think the better solutions can be, can be given. Um, and, and I would fully endorse what Gavin said about medium term certainty. The longer we have to plan budgetary wise, but also for the potential HR implications, it's better for the workforce and it helps us manage solutions which keeps everyone happy. Mr McPhee. Um, I think we, we recognise that some sectors fared worse than local government and some sectors fared better. Um, I think we have unique pressures in local government, particularly around care of the elderly, which continue to, to increase um, at a higher rate than, than, than other areas. And, and perhaps if that had been recognised, we would have been been helpful. I think as well, um, some of the, 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 the strings attached to the local government settlement were not as helpful as they might have been. I think um, councils have a, a commitment to improving educational attainment, for example, but having to maintain teacher numbers sometimes is, is um, not an outcome-based target which we would, would seek to, to impose. So. Um, I, I have no comment on whether it's fair or unfair, but we, we have managed within what we've been, been allocated. And I would like to echo um, Mr Stevenson's comments that um, the longer term settlement has been helpful in making sure we can plan ahead. Final question, and that is, what impact has welfare reform changes, particularly the council tax and the so-called bedroom tax, had on local authorities? Uh, and what is, do you think would be the, is going to be the long term impact of these changes in local authorities, Mr. Stevenson, that that is a that is almost the sixty-four million dollar question, and, and I think that, that the initial impact has been a, a huge rise in in the the demand for advisory services. The the fact that um, the people this was impacting on are are in many cases are most vulnerable, so therefore many of them don't have the the life skills to be able to access the vast amount of information that's around it as a universal credit test site, certainly trying to, trying to get 
um, people to fill in a 34-page form online has got its challenges. Uh, so the immediate um, challenge for us is actually to make sure everybody knew what was about to happen to them and what was available to support them through that period. And that's where most councils have been working very closely, and I think uh, our Desert Scotland said very well in pulling together the range of partners to deal with that immediate wave that hits us. Obviously, I've been also been looking to top up the support for um, rents that we can where within our powers, and that, that then at least could give you more than that. I think I would write to this as a real longer-term impact that, 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 that we need to avoid this becoming a, a rent issue, that the real issue about welfare reform is, that, that, is the, the, the impact it would have perhaps on rises in domestic violence if we start paying money back to, to uh, men and families and, and individuals rather than to landlords, potential rise in debt, homelessness. Um, even though we say we don't to, to get there. And the longer it takes uh, on health, now it's great to see communities pulling together and pulling together food parcels, but you look what's in the food parcels, it's tins of spaghetti. Ten years' time, we we're increasing obesity, so there's something about us being able to channel money into preventative work, healthy eating, teaching some of these groups how to cook that have never cooked the microwave, because they can't afford the microwave food, where are they going to go? It's going to go down into those cheap tins of beans, tins of spaghetti to feed their families. Also the issues of children that will start to turn up hungry at school as, as families are making different choices. And we've seen this before through the 80s and the 90s. So I think there's just something about we need to move the agenda and the discussion off the immediate rental issues and on to the longer term impact on our communities and our individuals and our families. And, and again, I think we haven't worked through the changes to the disability. We know from speaking closely with my GPs that the GPs, there's been an enormous change in workload for assessment. Um, around disability, but actually, particularly for rural the Priest and Galloway, where most of my elderly have a disability and live miles from a service, there will be an impact on the, on the uh, sustainability of that community if we don't look at that. So I think it's just about how are we going to use the budget to focus on the 10, 15 year consequences. And the final point I've said, I was, a, I was a child of the 70s when the start work and the mine closed at the same time in Ayrshire. And all of my male friends went to unemployment and never became the adults they should have been. And I know the long-term consequence of that as the first point of destination. And it's just something we're moving the agenda onto. And, and that's why in Dumfries and Galloway, we've had the health and, Joint Health and Wellbeing Unit presenting to our welfare subcommittee about the longer-term impacts on health and well-being of the individuals suffering from this just now. And that has been very revealing to, to my members that they need to be thinking and investing in projects that deliver that five and ten year solution. Before I take in Mr Puckeran and Mr McPhee to answer Mr Wilson's uh, question there, you mentioned a welfare subcommittee there in Dumfries and Galloway. I would like to know if the other councils have, have set up similar bodies to, to deal with these difficulties. Mr Puckeran? Um, no, we, we uh, monitor the welfare reforms through the Policy and Resources Committee. Okay. And and in response to the points that have been made, well, cutting down to the numbers, uh, Inverclyde Council set aside £1.3 million as part of its three-year budget to deal with the impacts of welfare reform. Uh, that's largely to do with the Council's contribution to the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, which obviously, as a Director of Finance, I'd hope that the Government's support of £23 million continues as part of the 14-15 settlement also to deal with the costs of increased money advice services uh, because there's a huge demand out there now for, for support, etc. Uh, dealing with uh, reductions in the DWP administration grant. Obviously, as the move comes to universal credit, then fewer people are getting housing benefit and that there will be reductions in the amount of, uh, the amount of grant that comes from the, the DWP to councils with the impacts. Again, I would echo what, what uh, Gavin said about the longer term impacts factored in that, and in particular the pressures that's going to put on social care budgets for those individuals who, who um, are not eligible for PIP and, and move off DLA, etc. You're going to have a, a concentrated impact on a very vulnerable part of, of the community, etc. Um, we, we, along with most other councils, had a visit from David Mundell, who, who came round all councils gathering evidence, and the information we'd pulled together and had independently pulled together was that within Inverclyde, the impact in 13-14 alone, with the culmination of all the, the welfare reform impacts, was about £10 million. Now, 
the council's put a million pounds in that leaves a nine million pound impact that, that we can't i mean the councils cannot you know pound swap with the dwp reductions in funding and there will be an impact on that on households um, and and individuals with the knock-on impact to local economies etc and rent areas um, so as far as the longer term is concerned picking up mr wilson's point obviously there's going to be huge pressure on social housing if there is a long-term reduction in rental income that's going to impact on the investment but i think the the bigger impact is likely to be in the social care side of things if individuals don't react well to the reductions in funding so make fee um well locally uh, the impact of the bedroom tax for example has we've has about 2300 individuals in now council houses who have been impacted by that first of april 500 of them had some level of rent arrears by the 17th of May, 1,700 of them had some level of rent arrears. If that continues, that pattern continues over the year, we'll see a £500,000 increase in, in lost rent, which, as uh, Mr Perkins indicated, could knock on to a reduction in investment in repairs and new housing of about £9 million a year. So it has a fairly big financial impact for, for the council and clearly for those individuals. Um, we did. Uh, do as much as we we could prior to this. Um, we met every one of those 2,300 people, explained the impact, tried to encourage them to, to maintain rent and pointed them in the direction of where they might get some financial help. But nevertheless, uh, we've seen quite a substantial uh, difficulty arising in people being able to pay uh, the, the amounts they were asked to pay. For the record, Mr McPhee, that's an impact on the housing revenue account, which could uh, affect housing capital and repair budgets. Would I be correct in saying that? That's right, specifically so housing revenue account. That, that 500,000 would amount, we, we could increase rents by a pound a week for those people who are paying or reduce capital spending um, by reducing borrowing. To, to I, I think that. it's important for, for the committee to know the difference between the general revenue budget and the housing revenue budget and the effect on, on both. Uh, and, on, of course, uh, from the housing revenue budget to the ha housing capital budget because of the different bits of welfare reform. Could, could, you, could you just ask Mr McPhee to give an indication of how much your local authority has set aside in terms of council tax benefit changes? Um, it was just over a million pounds we set aside, uh, again, um, to help people who are struggling over the short term to, to try to rebalance their, their finances, which is questionable how effective that might be without substantial additional help. Um, we've also um, enhanced the, the, our uh, financial inclusion team to, to try to make sure as many people as possible know what they're entitled to and, and where they can go. Um, we are working with the Citizens Advice Bureau. We're, we're looking for better, bigger accommodation for them because their, their waiting rooms are, are now pretty busy and additional um, resources there as well. So we've, we've done a whole range of things. Uh, across the, the general fund um, to, to try to mitigate the impact for individuals. John Pentland, please. I think it's quite clear that, obviously, through no fault of your own, that the welfare reform and, indeed, the bedroom tax uh, uh, are having a big impact uh, in your own local authorities. Do you think that that impact could have been uh, softened, if you like, if the Scottish Government had funded the, the whole shortfall? Gentlemen, again, you're on that fine line. Uh, I would say that the, the difficulty everybody's had is that, that we were all still trying to work out what it meant right up to the point that it got implemented. And I think that's been one of our real frustrations, that perhaps if the whole system had been delayed a year, we would have been able to put some of the mitigating measures. We would have been able to work with our individual clients and, and communities and how we want to take it forward. So I think that to, just to say that, 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 that um, the Scottish Government should have stepped in, to me, misses the point of we need to work out the consequence and the outcomes and where best does intervention help? Because if further welfare reform does come down the line, they can, they, they cannot all be that we will just substitute for it. I think what's needing is we need to do what we can now, but then working together with Scottish Government, work on on what mitigating factors would have the best, most sustainable answer moving forward. Not every person affected by the bedroom tax can aff cannot afford to pay it. 
at the moment we need to get over the hump of what is the can pay, won't pay element of that and then see what it settles down. Our job is to get us that time to see who are the real vulnerable, who are the people that we, and we all know them individually, that, that are really struggling with this so we can target our resources. And I think if we'd acted as a nation earlier, we might well have encouraged the very behaviour that we're, we're trying to avoid. And I think at this point, councils are working very closely, but I think in six to nine months, we do need to sit down with the full evidence in front of us and make sure we plan in advance of universal credit coming in to make sure we learn the lessons of this one moving forward. But my view is, I would have asked not for any, the government in Westminster to have given an extra year for us to have worked with individuals and families and how to manage their finances better rather than, than the short sharp. Any more question? I think we've got to be aware that these gentlemen are officers of councils, and I've talked about the fine line a lot today. Some of the questions that we have been asking are quite political, uh, and these guys don't uh, have the luxury of being able to answer that. Those are their personal views on it, uh, only. Uh, Mr Pentland. Could maybe rewind then about 10 or 15 minutes, say, convener. Uh, Mr Perkin, you said that the, the removal of the council tax freeze would in itself not be the panacea. Can I ask you then what would be the panacea when you consider that the evidence given by the Cabinet Secretary earlier there says that local government have, have had the best settlements since 2007 uh, to present? When we're near that fine line, uh, I know that you'll be unable to say a huge amount of more money from Westminster to, to Scotland or something else. But anyway, Mr Puckran. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I, I didn't come into local government for an easy job, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm having my wishes fulfilled. Um, so, 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 no, I mean, it's, it's the reality. You know, you, councils are, are multi, multi million pound organisations, and part of the challenge for any large organisation is continually to be looking at ways that you can deliver services better, more efficiently, more effectively. So, the expectation is that we should be making year on year efficiency type savings and that we don't expect to be fully funded all the time. Um, for, for everything that we're, we're, we're having to deal with because there's an element of sort of self-funding comes within that. I think anything that gives us flexibility yeah. is good. Anything that gives us longer-term funding certainty is good. I think ensuring that we're adequately funded for new burdens is good. And I think the health and social care integration is the, ca is the case in point. That has the potential to do great things in terms of pooling budgets and, and, and having joined up services and working together. But if it's not adequately funded, either from the council side or the health side, if it's viewed as a almost an element in cost shunting, where folk can offload their problem budgets into there and, and leave it for this new body to try and deal with intractable financial problems, then, then it won't work. So I think the importance of having accurate, transparent, longer term information helps us all do our job better. But very well, Mr Pucker and Mr McPhee. I, I tend to agree with that. I think um, <laughs> we need we need the long term um, picture to be able to plan ahead and make some of the changes we have to make. I suppose um, one area which is developing and which I think we, we need to, to take forward is how we cooperate with other public bodies, local government, police, fire, health particularly, to try to make sure all of the money we've got is used to, towards those shared priorities which we have. And I think that is the, the key. We have to be clear um, as a country what our outcomes, what outcomes we want and how we focus the resources we have in the public sector towards achieving those. Stevenson, do you want to add to that? To, to, to sort of raise it back to the, to, to, to the strategic, I think that the work that we've all been doing in the single outcome agreements in each council and the, and the refreshing of the community planning I think we, we must now start to use that to articulate the national and local priorities more clearly to, to the public, to our communities. They, they are, I mean, our communities, um, we know when they have the full knowledge, support reasonable decision making. And I think that we just need to now start using that mechanism to go and explain why we're going to have to do what we're doing so that we don't end up the first time people know about the cuts is when they realise that the library is shut. And I think that there's just something about we have in our community planning partners and the refreshing of the community planning environment and the single outcome agreements, clear articulation of what's important in each area, 
What I think we need to do is, is, is start being bolder in how we communicate and engage with our communities about why those are important and what the consequentials of that being a priority will mean on things that are not the priority. And I think that's, that's where a bit of the reticence sits at the moment. But I think we're all going to sign a single outcome agreement by the end of June, I believe. And, and so therefore we now have a document that clearly articulates the outcomes and the priorities for each area agreed by all the community planning partners. I think we now need to go on the front foot and saying this will be underpinning some of the tough decisions that we will take and engaging with our communities. Not everyone will like it, but I think we can't shy away from the fact that if we don't go out to explain what are our priorities and the consequences of holding to those, then the public will only view this as a series of cuts. Whereas, in fact, we're still going to spend, was it 19, was it 19 billion or something pounds a year? And I think we need to get the debate on to how we're going to spend money to deliver our priorities, as important as the, the, the money that we'll look to cut. Margaret Mitchell, are we supplementary? And then back to Mr. Kevin. Yeah, just very briefly on outcomes, that's been mentioned clearly in all of your evidence, what evaluation is actually done of the outcomes? I mean, in other words, you can achieve an outcome, but just how good was that outcome? I think it depends on your outcome. We, we in the police and Galloway, have spent a long time work. Luckily, we have the, the benefit of, be, of having, at that point, coterminous police, fire and health. So therefore, we were able to engage senior officers in, in slightly different thinking and working with the Scottish Government to get some, some academic input. And it was really amazing, some of the outcomes we came up with when the NHS inherited the prison, and we're thinking, what's an outcome for a strategic document that frontline staff would understand as meaning you're doing a difference? What's the indicator? What's that outcome indicator? And actually, when we finally asked the public health consultant, they just turned around and said, teeth. And we sort of looked at it, waiting for the number per... And actually, it came that the, the quality of a prisoner's teeth from when they go in to when they're in tells you about the whole health system and what that person's facing. Now, we hadn't even thought of it that way, but that type of thinking. So how do we know something's going wrong when they do the annual dental checkup for the prisoners? If their teeth are getting worse, there's something wrong with the, the health system within that prison. And that cut a whole raft of 40 different indicators that existed. And so we've got a number of those indicators that we're testing, because for me, they have to mean something to frontline practitioners that those are indicators something's going wrong and we need to do something, rather than these absolute output or input measures. And that was a really good example that I think took everybody by surprise that something as simple can measure the outcome of a system. And, and we'd never have got there under the old way of getting all the chief executives and all the directors in the room trying to work out outcome. We'd have ended up with input and output indicators, wouldn't we, and wrapped them up as outcomes. Yeah. Supplementary, Stuart Stevenson, and then back to Mr Pentland. Could we please be very brief? And gentlemen, brief answers now, please, as well, if possible. I, I just wanted to latch on to the teeth one. In setting that as an indicator, does that distort what then happens? Because if teeth is what you're going to be measured on, will the prisoners get fewer baths? And hence, will things like eczema and skin conditions uh, rise in athlete's foot? You know, in other words, that kind of thing has second-level effects. Mr. How Stevenson. do you deal with it? It doesn't say that the, the, the full suite of indicators exists down within each of the operational partner. But we, we ended up in community planning with analysis paralysis because there was just so much there. And what this does is say there's something wrong. So what you then do within our system is we call in the director stroke medical person and say, this is showing us something's up, what's up? So therefore, proper scrutiny takes place. Explain what's going wrong in the system. If you said this is the indicator something's going wrong, what's going wrong, what are you going to do about it? But below it, there'll still be the business plans and the performance indicators and all the heat targets that sit there. But we need something at the top that says, if this isn't on target, something's going wrong. We need to get the directors in and the office and ask them why. What, what is this telling us? rather than the answer lies in an indicator that we created. Mr Pentland. Uh, Mr Stewart asked you a question earlier on there, what a pound would mean in income in, in band D. Uh, can I maybe turn that around a wee bit? What would the 1% across the board be in, in income to the, each of your authorities? Across all bands? 1% yeah. on the council tax would raise a third of a million pounds. Third of a million in Inverclyde. 
I'm, I'm trying to scale up from Inverclyde. I, I could get back to you with that one. It's right, and I know that's not quite so easy to have off the top of your head. Mr McPhee. For East Ayrshire, that would be £500,000 a year. Okay. Um, a small supplementary from Margaret Mitchell and then on to Stuart McMillan, please. Finance question to, to finish. You'll be aware that the Cabinet Secretary is, has reviewed the business rate invent, incentivisation scheme and um, uh, on the basis the targets were set too low. Has that affected your council and to what extent? Um, I'm aware of the, the review that, that, that's been ongoing there. We didn't budget for any extra income from the BRIS. If we had got some, it would have been uh, a windfall to us. Um, we're not closing our accounts, anticipating any extra income from the BRIS either. But does that mean you weren't going to get any or you just didn't factor it in? We didn't factor any in and it was on the margins. I think um, in terms of the BRIS scheme, I think the challenge will be achieving the targets in future years because of the on the year on year increase in non domestic rates that's assumed in the spending review. It'll make it harder for councils to achieve their non domestic rates targets. Mr. Stevenson. The marginal effect and as our biggest problem is, is is being a rural economy is the empty shops in, in towns. Um, and the number of them that are held by big pension companies that have had in for the long game. So therefore they're quite happy for them to sit in the centre of Dumfries, empty. And, and so therefore, yeah, there could be opportunities from the ability to level uh, non-domestic rates on them for councils to, 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 to do innovative things that wasn't in their power. But our biggest, our biggest problem is, is the number of empty properties uh, that, that are sitting with large pension companies that don't want to fill them or are waiting for the market to pick up, that blight our, our, our small towns. If I could to be quite clear, on the target set, was Dumfries and Galloway to get absolutely no benefit if you reached your target? I could get back to you with the detailed figures, but it certainly wasn't a major part of the discussion I had with the administration. I think everyone knew how much they would potentially get if they made their target, so your evidence is that it was zero. Same for you, Mr no, Parkin. I, I didn't say that. I didn't think the gentleman saying that, uh, Mrs Mitchell. I think if you could clarify, clarify what it is to the committee, I think that would be useful. I think that would be useful evidence yeah. and accurate. Mr McPhee. Um, we didn't budget for any uh, increase uh, simply because, the, although the targets were set, achieving them was um, was pretty um, difficult to anticipate. So we we preferred to have waited until we achieved them before we started budgeting for that additional income. How much would you have got back? I don't know the exact figure to hand, but I can certainly have, let the committee have that. That would later. be helpful. Thank you, um, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, just a couple of questions. The first one just uh, is regarding the, the overall uh, budgets that you have received. And has, there been, uh, has there been any impact upon the reserves that, uh, that the local authorities uh, actually have, um, either uh, positive or negative, um, over the year, well, from 2007 up to the present date? And if you would like to give us an indication if, uh, if there has been an increase in reserves, has that been because of... Uh, future planning. Mr Puckton, please. Um, thank you. Um, I think uh, in the overview report that Audit Scotland did on the 12-13 or 11-12 accounts, Inverclyde had the highest percentage of reserves in Scotland, um, saying that the vast majority of it is earmarked for, for use to support the capital programme investment, uh, support employability schemes, etc. The amount that is only earmarked is 2%, which is round about the Scottish average, which equates to round about, a, in simple terms, a week's running cost for a council. So we view that's a reasonable level of reserves. We do not use reserves to balance our ongoing revenue budget. In fact, the last couple of years, we've put money into to reserves as part of the process to sort of prepare for the storm ahead, as it were, financially. And that's helped us certainly when we come to set future year's budgets. Sir Stevenson. Yeah, I think that the, the, the difference between the earmarked and the non-earmarked, most, most councils, you know, in Audit Scotland recognise about 2% is the minimum you should hold. For us, that's about £7 million. To give you an example, we, we, we like Aaron, were affected by that severe winter event. And I was spending a million pounds a day just in the west of my region. And, and therefore, the five reserves of seven million pounds, it would only have taken that to have lasted a week and I was, and I was out of money. Um, so I think reserves are important for local authorities. But again, an issue I think that you discussed with the Cabinet Secretary, we have pretty large reserves for our PPPs. 
to make sure future taxpayers don't end up bearing the full brunt of the cost. That was something that was advised early on with PPPs, but most councils were unable to put that money aside. In the Bruce and Galloway, we put cash aside to try and mitigate and flatten out the impact of the rise of PPP through that. that, that but that, as we get, uh, we were early, so therefore later on that became. But at some point, if this continues, we might have to look to reprioritise that, that funding to bring it back into the general reserve to, to, to supplement perhaps capital programmes and employability programmes as we move forward. But that would just mean that future taxpayers pick up the costs of decisions that were taken 10 years ago. But it's, it's part of our longer term financial plan. So therefore, I think there is the distinction that, that £7 million, if you're spending a £1 million a day in winter, does not quickly can be used up. Um, since 2000, I think 2007, our, our uncommitted reserves are around 6.7 million and now around 12 million, and that's been a deliberate policy to build those up, seeing the, the difficult times ahead. For 2013-14, um, we're committing about 4.2 million of that, simply to buy us time to make the changes which we need to make to, to get to that um, 37 million, million pounds a year less running costs by 2017. So it has been a deliberate policy to build up the amount of money we have, but we have, a, again, a deliberate policy to run that back down over the next five years. John Pentland. Very brief. Just because we're on rates, uh, convener, as, uh, could I ask the panel what their view is on the Scottish Government's approach to non-domestic rates? And is there anything you'd like to maybe see change, changed in that? And do you also agree with uh, the Cabinet Secretary's forecast for a large increase in NDR income? Very briefly, gentlemen. Mr Puckram. In terms, of, in terms of the forecast, it's not an area of expertise that, that we would have. We know it's been commented on by the likes of the CPPR, etc. And obviously, the, the risk of that sits with the Scottish Government, not with councils, because we'll have guaranteed non-domestic rates for the spending review period. Uh, effectively, the councils just act as a post office, uh, and moving it through. If the economy goes up, then the vets are in if it goes down. But it, it was just form part of the, the most council just view it as part of the general settlement. So to make fee. Yeah, similarly we, we collect the rates and pass them on to the Scottish Government. It's for them to, to, to work out what they believe the income's going to be and the risk lies with them if they get those sums wrong. Mr Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just a brief question to Mr Stevenson, wearing your solace hat. Mr Stevenson, you made reference to PPP commitments and the reserves that the council set aside to not to impose additional burdens on the local taxpayer. Could you indicate whether or not other authorities have actually made that same commitment? Uh, because it, we know that in terms of the graph that we've seen last week, that PPP payments will rise substantially. The Cabinet Secretary gave a figure of 540 million in 2007. My understanding is PPP commitments, financial commitments, will rise to almost a billion pounds, with a substantial part of that being on local authorities. Mr. Stevenson. Yes. So, you must remember that the government supports PPPs, but actually the larger element of it lies with the council to pay. PP, the, the PPP or PFI developed, so therefore, very briefly, the, where, where you were at your financial cycle as you entered into it, and depending what, what cash reserves you had, then, then initially everyone should perhaps have gone to cash back future costs. That was not available to a lot of councils, given you know, there was only one deal on the table at the time, and it was going to be PPP. So we were fortunate to take that longer term financial planning by taking pain elsewhere in the budget at that time. And, and we sit pretty now looking relatively saying that at least we have got some cash to play with. But that was not available to all the councils. Those that entered into the late PPP as budgets were starting to get cut would never have been able to explain to Electric why you were putting aside that amount of money. Uh, we, we were able to do it at times when we were getting 6 to 7% growth in the council budget. So therefore, it was, and, and so therefore, that was the time that we chose to do it. But in saying, moving forward, as, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, we'll need to be looking at all the funds available to mitigate any rise in, in tax for the local taxpayer. Very strict now in terms of uh, questioning. Mr McMillan, very briefly. Thank you. Um, how will the benchmarking framework uh, assist in actually dealing with the, the budget challenges that you face? Mr Parker. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's been a useful initial year. It will highlight individual areas for individual councils to work with colleagues where the figures that are produced you know, may look uh, very good for those councils and just to find out the way that they work, how they produce their 
figures how they deliver their services. So I think the term that was used by, by one of the chief executives was it was a tin opener, and I think that's what it is. It's a tin opener, and we can, we can build on that. Yes, if you don't view them as absolute, it's difficult in the political domain. I've got four and a half thousand kilometres of roads, it's difficult to, have, to keep the potholes filled. Um, but the, the important thing is work that, that we do in conjunction with East Ayrshire, that we, 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 you know, it's about who you benchmark with in the club. Because actually the real point of benchmarking is to find other people you can go to talk to about how you actually do it. That's the importance of it. So it's a, it's a good early stab, but actually the absolute input and output indicators only get you to the real point, which is identifying councils that you can go to talk to about how they do it differently. And certainly we're following lead, because East Asia have been doing this for a number of years, and have been very successful in targeting the service improvements by learning from other councils. Mr McPhee. Yeah, we've been working for some time with like, seven other councils who meet regularly to go through. Um, we choose an area to look at from, um, as we go through a programme. And um, the, the key is making sure we're comparing like we like. And once we're, we're at that stage, we can work out why there are differences. Are they policy differences? Are they performance differences? Are they just the level of service uh, differences? And that's been very helpful uh, for councils to take those decisions. They can maintain their position simply by saying, well, we're happy with our policy. We don't want to move to, to what somebody else is doing. Um, so the, 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 the benefit of them is getting behind what the numbers say rather than the numbers themselves. Very, very briefly, Mr Pentland. I think it's quite clear from the evidence that we received today that obviously local government is facing challenging times because of the, you know, the budget cuts that are being applied. Uh, do you see these cuts having a, an impact on uh, the wider public uh, services reform agenda? Mr Buckram, briefly. I'm not so sure about the, the wider public reform agenda. I think it's inevitable if the inflationary pressures, which have been backing up for some time now, when you look at pay inflation and what uh, employees within local government have received over the last few years, you look at the inflationary uplifts that maybe some of our partners, uh, some of our social care providers have been, you know, where the costs have been squeezed. And I was reading some of the evidence that came to committee last week in terms of that. When that, when that begins to break, when that begins to come up, if we continue to get flat cash or worse than flat cash settlements, something's going to have to give. There's a limit to how many efficiencies you can get out. We need to take our staff and our communities with us. Um, but actually, my view is that, that if we have that planning horizon, we know what's going to happen, that adversity is the time that public services are actually at their best. So I actually think that, that that's why I think health and social care is so important we get that radical change to the way we govern and deliver services. That sets the model for confidence across all the staff groups in our communities that there are ways to deliver different models of service that are safe. And I think that's, that's the secret. If we get that wrong, then the rest of it would be very difficult to put through. Yeah, I, th I think the position we're in gives us quite an impetus towards that, that, that reform, working closely, more closely with our communities, more closely with our partners. Um, moving towards preventative measures um, and seeking to in improve our performance and efficiency. So I think it's a real driver. It's a positive driver, I think, uh, is the way we see it. It's the position we're in. We have to go in and make the best of it. Finally, gentlemen, and this could probably uh, go on all day, let's be honest with you, but one final question. Uh, one of you said earlier on, I think it was Mr uh, Stevenson, um, there's enough talent within the finance community uh, to deal with what's ahead. Is there enough talent and is there enough training within the elected members uh, to deal with what's ahead? Um, Mr. Puckran, a very difficult one, I know. Could we be doing with some more training for folks who are dealing with finance and councils? It's part of an ongoing uh, programme of training for, for members, particularly at the last election when there was quite a high turnover and quite a lot of new members came in, certainly to to the council I, I'm part of. Um, and I think it is important that members are trained, but it's also important that the quality of information that's produced, which has been highlighted in some Audit Scotland reports, that we continually look at the information we provide and some of the thorny issues around how do you budget for outcomes, how do you measure the quality of services. These aren't easy issues, uh, but they're the, understandably the, the issues that members want to understand before they make decisions. Thank you. Mr Stevenson. I, I 
from personal, uh, speaking very personally, I think leadership. I think there, there, there is a difference between some of the, the, the natural leadership skills within uh, a politician and the leadership that this agenda needs. And I think that there's just something about collective leadership that, the training to understand the scale and how you lead yourself through such significant change. Because if we remember, my officers have only had spent their entire career in times of growth. We're asking them to, to, to do things that they've never really been trained for, and that's the same for elected members. And I think there's just something about that collective training and understand how do you lead through a, a, a change a program that we've never seen before. So I think that would be very useful. Thank you. Mr McPhee. Yeah, we have quite an extensive training uh, programme for members, both at an individual level, tailored to their own individual um, needs and, and uh, direction, uh, and corporately uh, through seminars on a sometimes bi-monthly basis to make sure people are up to date on what's happening and what their role in the whole process is. So I'm, I'm confident we're providing members with what they need in that in that respect. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, if I could turn to the committee and say that given COSLA's unavailability today, uh, would it be helpful for us to write to COSLA with all of the questions that we've posed today? Is that agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you again, gentlemen. I suspend this meeting uh, and we will move into private session in about 10 minutes. Thank you.